Rory, thank you very much. Everybody's joined us. Uh, thank you. And um, please hang on until the end because um, there's a little uh, poll that shows up and you can fill in a little form. Uh, feedback I give to Rory and um, I make him choose the winner of the Jet Brands Prize. Now I'm lying. I just I actually use a random number generator to, to do that just to so that I can sleep well at night. So um, over to you, Rory, and um, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Cornel. Okay, so um, hi, everyone. Um, if you want to, to know what I have been doing for the last nine months, 10 months of my life, it's that little URL that you see there, aka.ms forward slash Java dash learn path. I work for Microsoft. If you don't know them, they're a small Seattle-based startup um, out of Redmond that uh, you know does some software. You can follow me on at Rory Pretty uh, on Twitter, and I'm a cloud developer advocate. Um, and what does that mean? It means that I do DevRel, developer relations, and I focus on cloud with Java. And that little Java learn path is one of the things that we create uh, in my team that really tries to make developers' experiences more wondrous. And that's really the, the crux of this uh, session. And it's a focus on getting started with VS Code and Java and Azure and trying to make it as easy as possible to get into cloud. And some innovative new features that I've found and, and set with the product teams and helped them test it and then feed back to the developers to try and get them to understand it doesn't always have to be you know, sitting uh, in front of a Kubernetes cluster and trying your best to actually work out how a control plane. There's, there's better things in life to do. So you can access all of that. Now, I'm gonna start also with uh, just saying that it's not your, your uh, grandfather's Microsoft. Uh, I, I deal with a lot of open source uh, entities, companies, and um, you know, we, we bought a small company called GitHub, and we're gonna to touch on GitHub actions a little bit uh, later though, but uh, it, it's really also uh, what the, the, one of the topics of this session is that uh, we went full open source. We released an open JDK uh, recently. I'm gonna show you a demo of it soon. Um, and we're part of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, the open JDK, Adoptium. We're one of the founding members of Adoptium. Spring, we, we, we're really great partnership with Spring. We've got uh, one of the best products out there, Azure Spring Cloud. GitHub, uh, Visual Studio Code, incredible product. And then uh, we have also support for uh, other products and, and standards. And did you know, and this, this took my breath away, that we have 500,000 JVMs in production that Microsoft uses. Now, this isn't client or customers. This is just to get Microsoft working in the background with LinkedIn, Azure, Yammer, Minecraft, and then uh, all of the Android apps that also we got there. That's 500,000. And when you take the, uh, the customer sessions, those are in the millions, if not tens of millions, That's half a million. So we, we really kind of, kind of uh, invested heavily uh, in, in Java. So this is about how to get started. And the first thing we want to do is how to modernize your Java applications in Azure. And you can do that and you can look at all the different frameworks and the big boys there, the Java EE, uh, Jakarta EE, the Red Hat, Oracle, IBM WebSphere, Wildfly. You can create a VM up there. You can spin it up. You can use a VM if you want to. Um, we, we, we encourage you rather to move away from VMs because you're, you're really not cloud native. You're just like running on a tin and you, you've got a server there. Um, and we, we kind, of, uh, kind of encourage you to rather go to platform as a service or use containers. You can see there we've got infrastructure service, container platform as a service. We've got Kubernetes. We've got uh, Red Hat OpenShift. And then we've got platform as a service. So we, um, we've got Azure App Service. We've got, uh, you can use Java Standard Edition if you want to do with uh, Spring Boot, Tomcat, or JBoss EAP. And then also the managed platform as a service. Uh, which is Azure Spring Cloud. So I'll show you a little bit about that later. And, and that really is a, a delightful experience because it's a, it's a kind of a white label Kubernetes that is for Spring and uh, it, it brings in a lot of nice features. And then for control, we'll go through a little bit of the databases, but you get every type of database. Also these new databases that are called flexible databases that you don't pay for the instance, you just pay for usage. And I, and I love that because it means that developers don't have to pay. And then on the tooling side, we have IDEs, build tools, and then GitHub, and we'll go through some of that uh, in the demo. I've got a really nice three-phase demo that uh, will blow your 
your socks off. Containers, there's so many choices of the containers. And that with build packs also now, it basically builds your, your instance for you. You just say build packs, do that, and it just builds your instance up there. And you've got your development tools, you've got your containers, you can use Kubernetes, Red Hat, or container instances. And then your platforms can just integrate with all of that. And you've got Azure Arc, which talks uh, on premise. Tomcat and JBoss EAP. So Tomcat's been around forever. Everyone has it on their cloud platform. You can run it as Tomcat, you start in your war. But JBoss EAP is something new and I've been dealing with the product team around that. Now that's JBoss on app service, which means that you can just take your war and pop it into app service and it runs JBoss. Uh, and I've done a few sessions with that and it just blows people's minds away. Um, and, and that's pretty nice because it has load balancing and all those nice cloud features. Uh, on it. And I'm not going to bore you too much on slides. Don't worry. This is very demo uh, heavy. And then Azure Spring Cloud. So fully managed. So think about, you know, uh, Azure App Services or your AWS uh, Beanstalk or your Google App Platform. It's exactly like that, but it runs Kubernetes underneath there. It's got a nice little uh, life cycle that you can plug into it. It's got build packs you can tie into, and it's got all of those nice little observability um, and uh, VNet, auto scaling, all of that nice things that you would take uh, that you really want out of the cloud. And then ease of monitoring, we're going to look at that. It's got the best distributed tracing that you've ever seen. We'll have a look at that now. Um, databases. So we've got Postgres, MySQL, MariahDB, uh, Redis, Cosmos, uh, Azure SQL, managed instances. There's just, you want a database, it does everything and it can also scale and uh, monitor quite uh, easily. But here, which, this is really what we have uh, to talk about, build on your terms. And you know, uh, two, two developers, three opinions around what uh, uh, build tools they wanna do. And we, we, we can go off forever around which is the best build tool, but we, we support all of this in integration with developers because we know you can't win that battle. You can't say, please use this, like, you know, in the, the 90s and everything. They can't. If they want to use IntelliJ, let them use IntelliJ. Give them a toolkit to do that. Clips, fine. VS Code, fine. If they want to use Maven, great. But a lot of people don't use Maven. So I'm going to show you a demo later that uses Gradle. And you'll see how blazing fast Gradle is with cloud. Then GitHub. You know, I, I kind of think that everyone kind of is moving over to GitHub, uh, but if they want to use GitHub, they can use Jenkins. And, and then finally, Terraform. I've done a lot of engagement with Terraform and, and showing people how to do that. And if you go to those learn paths, you'll see one of the modules I created is how to use Terraform with uh, Azure, uh, Azure uh, uh, DevOps and also GitHub Actions. But we're, we're here, uh, final slide, uh, to look at a demo. And we're going to show you a little bit of uh, Terraform and you can go all the way from with Terraform, uh, with Maven, and then use GitHub Actions. And I'm gonna show you a lot of GitHub Actions. You can use Pipelines if you want, or Jenkins. So the demos are all available on the learn path that I've heavily invested and time away from my family that you really need to go and check though. We've got 14 modules there. We're constantly producing more and they're really great. And they're meant to be consumed at lunch times. So we've consumed everything. We've done everything under 30 minutes. And uh, I've even got an external review team that goes in there and says, uh -uh, cut that down, cut that down, cut that down. Because we want to make sure that the people can be able to do that. Not these long running kind of like, you know, uh, uh, courses that people will get too heavily invested. They have to be really easy to start and, uh, and, and envelop and learn a skill there. So you can go to aka.ms forward slash Java dash learn part. And that's all the slides I wanted to show you because we're going to do the rest of it in, uh, in demos. Uh, so let's go here. So the first demo I want to show you is, uh, is uh, Azure Portal. So I've got my Azure Portal here. And you can see there, I've got the, uh, you can click on there and you can go Cloud Shell. Now, the first thing I want to show you is uh, something that, uh, a small little project that we did called OpenJDK. Now, if you go into Cloud Shell there and you go Java dash version, what do you think it's going to show? Now, this is the, the Cloud Shell. This means everyone runs it. So you right now, if you're on Azure, uh, and you're not selecting your Java version, that this is the version that you're running. You're running the Microsoft Open JDK. It's there right now, it's in production, you're using it right now. It means it's installed nearly everywhere that you're using it, unless you specifically specify adopt Open JDK or something else though. Um, so uh, it's there already, and it's in what we call a preview stage. Now preview isn't doesn't mean that it's uh, not uh, ready for production. It just means that we're open for suggestions and we want to re get your review, your comments. You can go in there, you can go to the Microsoft uh, Open JDK uh, browser uh, download site. So you can go Microsoft Open JDK 
uh, and it will be the first one to click there. And you can go download it, it's uh, available uh, for uh, Mac, Linux, uh, Windows, all of that there. Uh, and we even have an early access uh, OpenJDK 16. There's some nice FAQs there. We, uh, we don't support uh, Java 8. Uh, you can use uh, Adoptium or Open JD, uh, Adopt OpenJDK for that. But this is our LTS, and uh, we are really uh, proud with it. So there's some nice uh, FAQs here also. You can go in there, and you, there's a nice blog there that my colleague Bruno uh, did uh, for this. So it's, it's running right now. So how do you get it installed locally? And I've got a Mac here because real Java developers <laughs> use Mac um, and I've got it running here and I use the package there and you can see Java dash version and I've got it running locally so um, but uh, I want to and I've got actually five versions here so the next thing is that I want to show you how to get started with this and to do that I'm going to uh, clone the uh, uh, pet clinic you know the the spring pet clinic uh, app and uh, let's go into here uh, let's go okay let's go okay and I've got the, the, the Spring Pet Clinic application here. This is uh, the Spring Projects but made by Pivotal. And it's a nice little application that you can, uh, you can say, here's a, a vet or uh, and a pet, and you can go visit uh, uh, a vet uh, and, and keep tabs of pets, though. So I'm going to clone this locally, and I've already cloned it already, so it won't take too long. And then I'm going to run it. I'm going to show you some of the new features uh, in VS Code. And I'm going to use the, uh, the Microsoft OpenJDK that... Uh, that that comes uh, with my Mac to to run it though. So and and watch this experience here. So this is one of the experiences I want to show you. I'm going to go code, click there, and then I'm going to go open with GitHub Desktop, and it's going to seamlessly open my GitHub Desktop, which you should see here. And then I'm going to go open in Visual Studio Code. Bwah. And it was simple as that. I had cloned it before, but it's it's simple as that. So there's no uh, Git clone or anything like that. You don't have to do any command line, and it's just uh, seamless. So now you've got it here, and you've got the Spring Boot dashboard. So the first thing I want to show you is I can run it immediately. I can just click on there, Spring Boot dashboard. It has uh, the Java language server you can see there uh, running, and it's going to start my, my Spring Boot dashboard up here because it already has insight into uh, that I've got a, a running JDK, and we're going to see that now. Uh, Spring Boot, and yeah, it did it. So I should be able to go into uh, localhost, uh, localhost, and not 80, 80, uh, 80, 80. And I've got my, my Spring Boot uh, uh, running here, and I can go find owners, and it's using an H2 database here locally here, but I've got, I've got everything uh, running here. So that's the, the first thing. It's a really glamorous experience, so you can stop it there. Now, when, you, when that starts up, uh, it's a little bit too small here. Let's go small, 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 small. Uh, and let's go open up the pet clinic application. When I click on that, you'll see there that it's running in compatibility mode for Java SE 1.8, but it's actually using the Java JDK 11 there. Now, how do you know that? And, um, and you want to change that? So you want to go into a, a new feature that we've launched called, uh, so let's go to command palette, and you're going to go configure Java runtime. And then configure uh, Java runtime. Let's just make that smaller. And uh, let's move that. Now you've got another new uh, window here. And it says, cool, this is using 1.8 here. But uh, it's actually using the Java Microsoft SDK to run Java 8, though. And you can see you can, you can stop it there. And you can change it for the project. You can even see how to do it with Maven. It gives you all of that. You want to install a new JDK, you can. You can download it there. It gives you all of the options to do all of those uh, runtimes. You can also see here that you can see what is the JDK for the language server. And I understand the language server is different to the project's uh, JDK. The language server is what Visual Studio runs to uh, look at the off-process language server, do all of the processing and send it back to you. So now I'm running here, the language server also Java 11. And then if I wanted to uh, change it, I can install another JDK. And if I want to see what's installed here, you can see there, I've got 16, 15, 11, and eight, and I can go and change that accordingly. And this is a great new screen that we've got, that one of the new screens that we've launched for um, in, this, in this recent quarter, for uh, Java at Microsoft. So that's the one screen. So I've got 11, I'm happy with 11. I've already checked that Spring runs there. Uh, and let's go back into our application and let's see what we can actually do here uh, with some of the new features. And these, are, these will blow your mind. Some of the new features uh, with um, uh, Visual Studio. Uh, let's make that a little bit bigger. There we go. 
Okay, cool. So the first thing I want to show you is the, the select JDK. The second thing I want to show you is that there's a new feature also called a welcome screen. So you can see the welcome screen. They're getting started some nice tutorials, but the welcome screen there, uh, we're going to close that and we're going to minimize that. The welcome screen is you can go create a new project, open existing project, take a tour. You've got the configuration, uh, Java runtime, but creating a new project is absolutely incredible. So creating a new project gives you the option to scaffold out with uh, a Noble Tools Maven Spring Boot. So that it actually goes to the Spring Initializer on the web or Quarkus or Micro Profile. And Micro Profile, if you click on Micro Profile, it'll give you the option to say, okay, cool. What are all the versions that you wanna do? Uh, what are all of the libraries you wanna, you wanna take here? Uh, you can see there, com.example, I'm not going to run it right now, demo, but it tells you, okay, what are the versions, uh, Wildflower, and it gives you all of the libraries there. And we've done a lot of work in this to make this easy to use uh, and uh, to start with. I'm not going to do that right now. So that's the welcome screen here, but let's let's go back into our project and see uh, what are the new features that we've got um, that really help you to get code. So the first thing I want to show you here. This is the, the and not the project view. So this is the kind of the module view that you get here. But we also have something that we release called a project view. And if you recognize this, this is similar to like Eclipse project view. It actually uses uh, the Eclipse, uh, like, you know, uh, the look and feel. And it gives you all of the, the kind of the, the typical kind of Eclipse look and feel. So you've got the source main Java, resources, test Java. You can even see what your JRE is running here because you've got your system libraries here. You can go in there and it'll tell you what, you, what you're running here and, and point to your, your JRE system library. So this is really nice. If you like the project view, you can go in there and you can access uh, the, uh, the project view fr uh, from there. Next thing I wanna show you is the type hierarchy. Uh, and a lot of people have always said to me, Rory, uh, Visual Studio Code is different from IntelliJ and some of the big uh, Eclipse IDs because it doesn't have good refactoring or also typing because you, you wanna uh, do that uh, uh, package level uh, type hierarchy uh, visualization. So I'm gonna go into my VET uh, POJO here and I've got my VET here and I've got a speciality. So uh, I think the speciality is supposed to be there. Let, let's check what it is. So if I go into, uh, I want to go to person, sorry. Uh, I want to go to owner and then uh, owner is a, oh no, I want to go model. Where's my person? There's my person object. Um, you can see already I'm getting a little bit stuck. I want to see how many people extend uh, person. So you can go into person here um, and then from person here, I can uh, click on person. I can right click in there and I can go to uh, go to show type hierarchy. Do, 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 whoa. Now it gives you the ability to see the implementations, like almost uh, like interface implementation. Now I can go there and see exactly what is that. And this was an, a really big ask to show people that uh, you know you can access the, the type hierarchy with that. So you can go into owner here and you can also go into there and you can go right click and go show implementations, uh, show call hierarchy. And it's, it's starting to feel more like an IDE at uh, Visual Studio Code. So let's, let's close that. Um, and then uh, what about, uh, uh, that's great Rory, but what about if you wanted to do some refactoring? So under VET, I've got something called a speciality. Uh, and a speciality is just a, a little uh, named entity, whatever the vet does as a speciality. Now I want to drag this speciality, check this out, into the, the owner package. What do you think is going to happen here? So I'm going to click it and I'm going to drag it into, uh, uh, stop moving, into owner. Now normally what happens is that it just drags it and you have to do everything yourself. Now I'm going to click it and it's going to go, are you sure you want to move? Yes, I want to move. It gives you a preview. So now you can go show preview. And now it's going to give you the preview and the refactoring and everything that's going to change. Uh, no, let's go there. Very similar to a RDE that you would pay money for. Um, and you've got all of this here and you can go and click it and see. And uh, then you can just click on it and it just changed it. And our speciality now is in the uh, owner package and it works fine. And this is, this is fundamental now, which means that Visual Studio is now encroaching on the full-fledged IDE space though with uh, type hierarchy and also being able to do uh, refactoring and just move things around though. Um, okay, cool. So uh, then next, I want to show you some new features in Maven. Uh, and I'll do a demo a little bit later with Gradle that will blow your socks off. So Maven now, and I always really wondered why it wasn't Maven support, uh, why, life cycle support. So you've got the Maven here, it's the pet clinic, and you drop it down and you'll see immediately I've got my plugin support, which is, uh, it, it always kind of uh, had here. 
let's make some room. Uh, and the plugins will go in and intercept the, the POM and, and pull, it, pull it out there. So if you want to do Spring Boot run, it will have Spring Dash Boot colon run there. And it was very hard to actually understand what was going on. But now with the life cycle view, you just get what you want. And it's much easier to understand. You can go install and everything like that. You can just run it from there. So between the Spring Boot dashboard, and, and this is usually a paid feature for a lot of uh, IDs, and then that there, it's easy to work with Maven uh, projects uh, with some of the, the, the nice refactoring there. Next thing I want to show you is the test explorer. So I've got my uh, test explorer here, my window here. And you can see here, this is also very similar to a lot of the enterprise uh, IDEs here. So test find all, and this will kind of, uh, you can see here, I can either run the test here, but the test explorer, uh, this is also a new feature this year. Um, I can click that and it'll run the tests there and I can run through all of those tests there. And it, it's a great opportunity to really run your tests in a nice uh, kind of succinct, uh, clean way though. So did that run? And uh, yes, that ran, ticked there. Yay, enterprise. Um, and yeah, so then you've got the spring dashboard, which you've already gone through. And then finally, uh, and this is the nearly the end of part one of my uh, demo, we've got the Azure dashboard. So if I go here on my side here, you'll see, uh, sorry, there we are. We've got the Azure dashboard and I have many, many uh, features of this Azure dashboard. Uh, I want to get rid of help and uh, feedback because that's not really helping me. So I've got uh, resource groups I can click through. And I've got uh, my uh, Azure subscription. And if I wanted to change my Azure subscription, uh, I can, uh, let's go, let's make that a little bit smaller because it's zonking. Uh, where do we go there? Azure. And uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a feature. I can't remember where it is, but you can change your Azure subscription there. So I've got my resource groups here. I've also got the ability to see my app services. So I can get my app services. Now that Spring Boot app that I just showed you there, I've deployed it earlier uh, today uh, and I can go uh, onto the uh, Spring Pet Clinic app there and I can go there and I can just go uh, browse website and I just deployed it from uh, deploy to web app or you can use um, Maven there. You can start, stop it, uh, you know, SSH into websites, everything like that. So when you browse the website there, uh, it'll go uh, straight into uh, the new app that I created there and it just works. Uh, it's using an H2 database, uh, but I'm gonna show you something uh, pretty, uh, no, okay, let's go back there. Uh, pretty spectacular. I've got this running here on Terraform. One of the things that I did on the learn path is create a learn path in Terraform and GitHub Actions. And then you've got just MySQL here. You can see the application settings are, are plugged into a, a MySQL, uh, wait, no, not that one, uh, databases uh, deployments. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so uh, did it that one? Let's just see here, uh, application settings. I think I showed you the demo of the one with MySQL. Oh, it's that one. So <laughs> I actually showed you one with MySQL. So that's running on MySQL there using Terraform and GitHub Actions. So that's the app service here. You've also got Azure functions, your serverless functions, storage, virtual machine, databases, and then, whoa, Spring Cloud. This is new. Um, and I've got a Spring Cloud application running right there. And what I've done here is I've got the Spring Pet Cleaning running in a microservice environment. Now, this is the dovetail into part two of this demo, which is Azure Spring Cloud. Now, uh, Azure Spring Cloud is a managed Kubernetes instance, but you don't see it as Kubernetes there. So if I open up there, I've got my admin server, API gateway, customer service, vet service, and visit service there. And my API gateway is really where you hit it there. And if I open up API gateway, you can see the app instances, environment variables, JVM options, and scale. I can scale Kubernetes directly from here. So if I want to do, I can scale it there, but I'm not going to scale that one. I can go into uh, app instances and I can right click on my API gateway and I can go start streaming logs and it will stream my Kubernetes node instance there straight out from my Azure uh, Spring Cloud into my uh, terminal here. And this is something that we really brought out and we were proud of. Um, and it's a, it's a great uh, uh, mechanism for you to, uh, to you to test. Don't know why it's not streaming here. Maybe I haven't hit it in a while though. But let's go into the, the actual instance there and let's show you what it looks like. So uh, spring, uh, let's go spring, um, spring cloud RPZA. And I hit this with a couple of thousand transactions earlier. It's the exact same thing here. Um, and then uh, you've got your owners here and this is running in a MySQL database. But how long does it take? And I, I mentioned to um, Cornel in the beginning here, if I go edit owner and I say I submit there, how long did that take for the database? And wh what is the traceability there though? So 
Uh, I am now, uh, let's go into clouds. I want to show you the, the logging definitely. So app instances, right click on that and go start streaming log. There's a huge win though, when you stream the log here. So there, there we go. And uh, Franklin, the found Franklin and was the log that we, that we did there. But I want to see how long that took. So uh, to do that, I'm going to go back into my portal here. Uh, where were we uh, in my portal here? Um, and uh, I've got a end-to-end -end transaction. So you can go into uh, Azure Spring Cloud there. Let me just, uh, so Azure Spring Cloud. I've got the in Spring Cloud instance of my microservices here. Um, and uh, you can see there where, where it's running. And uh, let's make that a little bit smaller. And now I've got something called uh, Application Insights. And if you know OpenTelemetry uh, or uh, one of the, the, uh, the enterprise things, this comes out of the box here. So I can go to Application Map. Um, and then I can now view my application map. And I didn't change anything. This comes out of the box with it. And this is a new feature that we launched last month that the agent-based monitoring is out of the box. So I can see there, I've got my customer service. I've got my instances here and I can uh, drill down. So if I wanna go into my customer instance, you can see there uh, 160 calls, but I can go uh, last hour or I can go last 30 minutes. So I can go last 30 minutes and I can uh, test there to see there, there should only be a few calls because we only did a few calls there. Uh, yeah, I can click on customer instance there and I can go uh, view in log, investigate performance. And if I go investigate performance, um, I can see some database uh, uh, changes there, but um, I have set the telemetry to only do every 10th message there. So I wanna, I wanna show you what it does look like. So from customer service here, uh, uh, let's just go refresh there. So from customer service there, you can get through to investigate performance, but I'm gonna go investigate performance from string cloud here. because I wanna show you exactly uh, what it uh, looks like. So I wanna go there, I wanna go performance. I wanna show you an end-to-end. -end. I wanna to prove to you that the database isn't the slowest point there. So I can see the performance here. I can see the operations, uh, get pet types, owners, all of that there. And I can click on uh, owners here. Um, and I can get all of the transactions for all of those uh, in the samples. So I can drill down into all the samples and I can click and see, wait, um, owners was called there and um, I can get an end-to-end -end transaction breakup. And this is a brand new feature we only launched last week there. And now I can see, wait a second, the, the site went to uh, customers and it called them find all. And how long did each one of those three milliseconds? So the actual uh, transaction there, took uh, about 70 milliseconds, but the database took three milliseconds. I can get all of the telemetry there with all of the SQL statements there. Um, and I can go through uh, each of that uh, for that. And this, is, this, this, this means that you can put it up there in a microservice environment, and then that gives you the telemetry out of the box. I didn't have to change anything there. Um, and you can get all the way down, that's uh, with NoSQL, all the databases, um, anything that you can see, think of as a dependency, it will bring out there for your end-to-end -end transaction um, uh, uh, details. And the last thing I want to show you with Azure Spring Cloud is the uh, order scaling. So we've got our, uh, our apps here. And order scaling is a metric-driven system. So if customers, uh, the customer service there was under load, you can see there I've only got one instances. But I can say to that, if the CPU spikes or the JBoss sessions actually spark, then scale up. Uh, sorry, scale out to multiple instances. You can scale up to a bigger server, but scale out to multiple instances based on the metrics and then scale back inside when you uh, don't actually need the load, which means I can lower the cost. It's called pay as you go. And we're, we're, we're looking at a lot of managed platforms now moving towards that. Instead of saying, how much do I need is how little do you need? Because you want to scale it there and give the extra resource to something that uh, actually needs it. So you go into the customer service there, you go into uh, custom scale, um, and then you go into scale on the metric, and then you go add a rule here, and it's rule-based stuff here, uh, average here, uh, and I want to go, uh, I want to go Tomcat uh, sessions here. So let's go uh, do, 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 run some Tomcat request uh, total count. And then when it hits uh, above 60 there, then, uh, then you can actually go increase count by five. So we'll just add that there. So that'll scale up. And then you wanna go add a rule that when the, uh, the Tomcat request count, uh, let's go here, Tomcat request count, uh, request count is uh, less than or equal to, so let's go greater than, so less than or equal to uh, 70, then, um, 
decrease count and scale down. So decrease count, uh, decrease count to uh, one. And that's really scaling up and that's really cloud native. This is a new innovation that we brought out to that. And this is Kubernetes in the background. So you mess a Kubernetes clusters running hundreds and hundreds of service that you've got your spring app there. And all you have to do to deploy that is just right click in your app and go deploy. And that's, that's really uh, what I wanted to show you there. And we've got VNet support also, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Part three of our demo. So I've only got uh, three parts of our demo and then we can open for question and answers. I'm gonna show you how to get started in cloud in three steps in under 10 minutes uh, using Gradle and using Spring Cloud. And this, this cool Neil, if you're listening to that is gonna blow your mind. Um, so it's really the, the first time that this has actually worked on a live demo because I've been sitting with the product team to get this to work and helping them to test it. So you see that product uh, DevOps starter. So you click that on Azure there. And now I've got a, just a backup there in case it doesn't work. You always have a backup in your demos. You got create. Now I'm gonna create a Spring Boot app running Gradle, deploy to my application using GitHub actions in under 10 minutes in four steps. I'm not gonna really type a lot there. Um, and I'm gonna choose Java. You can use Node.js, PHP, uh, static website, Python, Ruby. You can even use, and you can see here, uh, you can change it to, instead of using GitHub Actions, into Azure DevOps. Framework, I'm gonna use Spring there. You can use JSF service there. I'm gonna use a Linux app web apps. You can do web app for containers or even Kubernetes. Um, and then I'm gonna authorize my GitHub, act, my GitHub account to actually be able to use Azure though. Um, and then I'm gonna call this here, Josie Jug. RPZA, got my subscription there, South Central US, fine, pricing tier, fine, review and create. Um, and this is, I'm gonna do this live with you now. It's gonna go check if everything's hunky-dory. And then it's gonna go in and create an, a GitHub repository with a GitHub Actions. And it's gonna start to uh, provision my resources using an ARM template. You could also use uh, Terraform if you wanted to. Um, and then it's gonna deploy it and then run. And then I know that, um, Cornel, you said you like uh, unit tests there. It's gonna run functional tests against my application, preset functional tests that have already been set up to make sure that your application uh, is actually uh, running. So let's wait for this to, uh, to come back there and then we'll see exactly what it is. Now, the, the novelty of this, it's actually using Gradle in the background to execute all of this. And what we found out is that because uh, Gradle has that lowest cost routing, that means that it, when it looks at the dependency trees, what we noticed with Maven is that Maven took about 10 minutes just to download all of those dependencies. And it was too long, uh, especially with these DevOps starters, because what happens was, you know, you want to be able to uh, get a little bit started. It is taking its time now, but you want to, Gradle to actually do this quicker. And what we did is we took 10 minutes of the Maven uh, build to download all the dependencies and Gradle takes one to two minutes. And that it's, it's a bit insane. So this doesn't come right here. I do have a backup. Um, I, I've, I've always, when, when always you do uh, uh, testing, always have a backup here. So let's look at our backup here. Um, it might be for whatever reason that is not uh, coming back, but we'll come back to there eventually. So I've got my backup here. I've got my launch space uh, application here. And you can see here, I've already uh, done the application. Um, and uh, authorize there again. And you'll see here that it has a GitHub Actions repository linked to a, uh, uh, well, okay, there we go. It's uh, provisioning it there. While uh, in the background, it is uh, running there. Uh, cool, provision prerequisites, submitting the deployment. Notice I didn't click, okay, I'm gonna need to speak to the product team about that. Um, yeah, so it's submitting there. Now I've got my, uh, let's go back to our DevOps starters. It should actually see it here now. Let's go refresh. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to there. Right, there it goes, there it is. Okay, it picked it up. Uh, and it's now going to provision my database, sorry, my application for me uh, with the uh, the Josie Jug uh, repo. So there we go. And let's come back there. It's going to provision it there. So let's, it should actually come back into the DevOps starters when it's ready there. So I'll show you what it actually is going to come back with. Uh, and then we'll see how long it took. So this is the, the launch space version of here. Um, and the launch space uh, version uh, is uh, a repo in uh, GitHub. Uh, that I created previously here. So I can click on there and I've just got my re repository there. And you'll see there, it's got my application, my ARM template, and it runs a very basic Spring application uh, with that. Uh, but uh, I've got my build application source, my deploy to web app, uh, Azure web app. And you can see there, it took two minutes to, to start up and then uh, a minute to deploy and uh, 40, 47 seconds. So this is down from 12 minutes 
to uh, under uh, you know uh, three minutes though. So I can I can click on the the Azure resources. Um, but uh, let's go back to our DevOps status there and see if it did actually create it. Because I want to show you something. There we go. So Josie Jag there, and it's busy creating it. And you can see it in real time now that we're gonna we're gonna see this thing actually create it though. But I want to show you something even. But I'm gonna develop on that while it's actually working. But I'm not going to develop on my local instance. You can see that it's already built the application. It's busy deploying to Azure App Service, and that is very quick. Eh? Uh, and you can click on the deploy to uh, uh, Azure App Service here, and it's got the GitHub actions here. And you'll see there setting up job. It's going at uh, downloading the build app, uh, artifact. And if you go to build application uh, source here, it's using uh, build with Gradle here. And it took 33 seconds to build my entire application. It's a little spring uh, application that just says hello world there. Uh, it runs through there, uh, gets all the applications there, and then deploys it to uh, uh, Azure Web App. And then it's deploying the, the ARM template. I know what you're thinking, Rory. Um, how do I get started with this? So one is you can do exactly what I said before. You can clone it there. Two is you can download it with uh, or open it with as, uh, GitHub code spaces. So we're going to do it with GitHub uh, code spaces. We're going to go new custom code space and watch how quick this is. Um, it's still in uh, beta. So it's, it is going to launch sometime in the future. And you can also open this in on my local desktop. Now it's going to open in code spaces. That means that I create an application, created a, a, a GitHub Actions uh, using Gradle, and I've got now with my um, uh, let's go here, my ARM template with code spaces, and I can uh, actually see the the same uh, uh, benefits that we had when, when I showed you that. So I can go into their Java. I can change my uh, my Java version there if I wanted to. I can use the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft SDK. But now uh, let's just wait for the uh, instance to uh, stop because what I want to show you here, uh, let's not the end to end transaction details. Let's wait for that to finish here, the Azure resources. It's up already. So uh, it should uh, take a few seconds to start up here. But I want to do that because I want to push it live now. Uh, sorry, I want to do another change. So I want to go into my source uh, main uh, main uh, resources. I'm going to say hello, Kunil here. So I'm going to go index.html. Um, and where is, uh, you can see there, it's, it's coming around there. Where is it's, uh, well, it? It will come up there eventually. Uh, where it will say uh, hello there, I'm going to actually say, uh, instead of success, I'm going to go hello, Kunil. Um, and then I'm going to push it. And I've got my CRCD running already because GitHub Actions will pick it up. And I went from my Azure DevOps starters into code space and never touched my laptop. I've this, this entire time, I haven't touched anything locally here. So I can go Cornel, this, uh, that's not how you spell your name. Cornel, this is for you. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, and then I'm going to push it here. And watch when I push it here. So I've got push. And then I go back into my instance here. And it's going to run it again, uh, and uh, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah, it's you can see there. Uh, it's it's going to push it to there, um, and when it picks it up, and it's going to deploy it to the uh, uh, developed uh, Azure Web App here. And then you've got you can see there it's running my functional test, and this is what I wanted to show you, Kunil. It's running my functional test. It's it's starting up Selenium in the browser in on your GitHub Actions. Um, and uh, yeah, so once this is finished, then it's going to push the Hello Kunio, and we can come back to that a little bit later there. There's Chrome driver running. And this is insane because it means that you're running your unit tests, uh, your Selenium tests, your GitHub Actions, your Gradle-based stuff, your RDE, everything in the cloud. And all using those new features that I showed you in VS Code. Um, and uh, yeah, just push the, the Git change to GitHub Actions. You can open it locally if you wanted. Uh, and there, it's, it's finished the... The uh, test though, so the Cornel version there, uh, Cornel, this is for you. And it's going to run through that and then it's going to say, uh, Cornel, this is uh, for you. And this is really what I wanted to show you, the crux of all of these sessions here, that uh, it, it's just such an easy process. It's like a digital process. We were coding in analog before, and now with the OpenJDK, um, the Microsoft OpenJDK, the VS Code, uh, all of those nice changes, Azure Spring Cloud, the DevOps starters and code spaces, everything is kind of coming to a fruition where it's just an, a gloriously a wondrous, fluid experience. And that's that's what I wanted to show you today. You can access the slides that I showed you before. Uh, let's show you those uh, PowerPoint again. You can go to aka.ms forward slash java-learn-path. 
It shows you everything there, it shows you Azure Spring Cloud, how to get started with Visual Studio, all the Spring starters, everything that I showed you, the Maven, the Maven enhancements that we've got also there. Um, so yeah, so that's what I, I wanted to show you today. So uh, Cornelio, let's open up for Q, uh, Q and A's. I know that I took nearly all of the time though. So hopefully we still have some time for questions and answers. I mean, we don't have a time limit. I think we're here to <laughs> stick to it in an hour. There was one question that came up. Uh, does configure Java runtime in VS Code work when you're using uh, JNF? So it's one of the these programs that allow you to switch multiple um, Java environments. Um, so I, I had an actual challenge different... with that myself. Not, I'm not using JNF. I just had a set of multiple JDKs installed. And I actually had a challenge to um, uh, to get that configured, but I didn't spend an inordinate amount of time uh, digging through it um, to figure out uh, if I was doing something wrong or... Um, so to answer your question, Cornel, it doesn't use what your operating system is defaulted to. You actually can go mm -hmm. into your Java settings so if you go into, uh, 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 sorry, code, is, uh, no, no, there we go. Uh, no, uh, let's go. Roaming code, user settings, uh, JSON. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's in Java settings here. And you can set uh -huh. the path in your Java settings in your environment, which well, will override your, it. yeah. And it, 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 it uh, bathed on uh, uh, Solo 13, and on sort of 11. So I don't, I'm, no, I'm not sure. Let me just double check. They keep complaining about the one and I... Um, yeah, so I, I, can't, I can't remember where the actual, pre uh, the preferences, the settings. So under settings, you give, you're giving the option to actually yeah. go in and choose your default workspace and your Java path uh, for your compiler. So you can go actually go there and you can go JDK and it'll give you the option to choose your Java home. So you can go edit and settings.json uh, and then your Java home, you can set up your, uh, your Java home here uh, or your, your default JDK. You can see here, I've got my default JDK is Java 11, but that might differ mm. from what you're doing uh, with on your local operating system. So you can live in the cloud and you can live in Visual Studio and you can completely overwrite what you have there, which is great because your workspace then, if you go to another computer, it can still use this. It can download it and can say, listen, exactly. I've got this compatibility here. So yeah, so the Java configuration runtime, you can see there, I've got true as my default and all, all projects then uh, will load Java 11 as my default environment. Let's see if I can, I can find that. Uh, so if you, there's a welcome, there's open Java settings. Uh, Java, there's 25 different things here. Uh, I see they heavily lean on um, established stuff. So if you've got an existing Eclipse project and you open it in VS Code, um, you check out, are check Cornel's just going to be there. Hello, Cornel. And we, we push that with Gradle. So it's hello, Cornel in Gradle. Yep. But I, I mean... I've seen Gradle do awesome stuff. I've, I, um, I've been using it since um, the release of the first version. And um, I mean, one of the big projects I did was, was uh, it's, it's a huge project that has over 300 modules, if you want to call it that. Um, most of them are uh, library projects. And then there was about 120 of them that were runtime projects and that was a mix of Corba apps and EJB um, uh, years that you would uh, deploy a separate um, enterprise apps and then there were about four or five that were web apps. So when I got there that project typically took uh, full build was an hour and a half and um, the smallest build was like 25 minutes if somebody made a change. And they had a mix of a lot of different uh, build tools and we moved everything into Gradle so that we had all the dependencies in line. And um, 
And then we have a, had a situation where we got the full bolt down to about 50 minutes, but a small bolt was a minute um, because um, all the dependencies are declared and uh, doesn't waste time to on stuff that hasn't changed. And um, once again, yeah, it's the same story. Um, Marvin yeah, this is running put so the stuff in a, in, a, in a line and um, yeah, yeah, Ravel the, the, can the, figure out the interdependencies. It can run stuff safely in parallel and um, can download your dependencies at one and that makes it, And if you're in the cloud, it is yeah, like yeah, it makes it way more cloud native. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we we use um, uh, we still use Bitbucket uh, for our um, company stuff in the cloud, but even there, I mean, Gradle, um, uh, Bitbucket allows you to cache your uh, your dot Gradle folders, or you can arbitrarily set up. Uh, caches if you want and it's just a bit faster to download that big zip and unzip it than to do a, a clean um, fetch of all the dependencies uh, from uh, Maven Central and the only reason I keep the caches on is to reduce the load on Maven Central because they're starting to introduce rate limiting which um, uh, you don't want your bolt to fail because the right limit said ah failure and then your bolt fails and then you uh, you've got to go right back to the top so um yeah we noticed uh, that the maven bolts that were taking like 13 minutes with the mm -hmm. uh, github action so definitely have a look at this the devops starters here um and you can see that it took 51 seconds to build it with uh, with gradle yeah no, no, I mean, there's so many other things that you can just slap into Gradle because it's a, I mean, it's not a bolt tool. It's a task managed, a task runner. And um, you can define task dependencies and you can define um, uh, uh, um, all, all kinds of other stuff. So you can have uh, dependencies on uh, libraries, as an example, or on a zip file. So, um, for uh, uh, let me give an example. I have a project that um, we use Spring Boot just to package the uh, the Angular app that we've built. Um, but there's some static content that we have to be able to serve, and that's in a library, and um, uh, um, that just gets pulled in. And um, the app can then either serve the, uh, the Angular app or the Spring Boot app can serve the, the, um, the static content. And to tell Gradle, hey, go and fetch these, the latest version of this and unpack it over there to, um, uh, to, to structure the app in the proper way is very easy. If you try and do that in Maven. Yeah, no, thank um, you. It is... Um, um, it's not the, the same level at the moment. You've got options where you want to start making decisions based on your environment, then it gets tough. But with Gradle, you're actually writing uh, Groovy or Kotlin code um, around a DSL. So you can easily make uh, decisions and based on the decision, go that way or so that way. Does that mean that you're now a fan of Azure DevOps starters, if we use Gradle. Oh, definitely. I mean, um, it just makes sense. It's, um, would you want to try and write a lot of YAML to get the same thing done? No, oh, never. You because, can, um, you can, and you can do the same with uh, Azure Spring Cloud with YAML imagine, with those Spring yeah. applications. But uh, yeah, so if, if, I, if I show you now, what you can do with, uh, if you see my screen here, with uh, the customer service there, you can just right click there and go deploy and specify your jar. And then it goes, just takes the, I don't have it right now with me, but it will just take the jar and then just deploy it into your uh, microservice application. Now this microservice application, if I go into the project here, uh, it's actually split out pretty nice. And I've got, uh, I'll put the, um, the links through and the links are in that aks.learn path. Um, but it's, uh, you can see here, 
we've got the uh, customer service there. And if you right click on the customer service, you can go just, uh, you can just go deploy. Um, well, uh, yeah, there's a mechanism here. But you can just go launch it and deploy the customer service right there. And then the, the, the observability, like you said before, um, that observability end to end, you know, I've, I've had so many times when people have said to me, no, uh, Cosmos DB, no SQL is slower. And then I've said to them, no, no, they will eventually find a way to do that. And this is the first time I've really been able to do that, that you can take all of your select statements, you can bundle them all there and you can say, how long did it take? So 61 uh, milliseconds for all of your select statements and you bundled them all together there. Um, and the custom service in totality took 62 milliseconds. But each one of those select statements actually took only three milliseconds. You can get each individual select statement there, the rest call uh, and the example for each one of those rest call. But you can also go, uh, if I go uh, into the Azure Spring Cloud instance here, um, and uh, please remind me to uh, delete this also afterwards, because uh, I've actually got all of the scripted, so I just scripted it in the morning. Um, and if you go into uh, application insights, uh, so you get the application map, which I showed you, and then you get performance and you get also live metrics, but the application map is also just spectacular. So if you, if you see here the, the, uh, the last hour of the components, and you can drill down into each one of those components, the customer service, the vet service here. So if you go into customer service here, and you can view in the logs also, which it's got distributed logs, you can go, uh, go to details for each of those, all failed dependencies. Um, and if there were any failures here, you can actually get those failures. So let's just see, can I find a failure? Sometimes I'm lucky enough if I've, if I've hit this hard enough uh, to failures. Let's just see here, visit service. Is there a failure here? Uh, no, I don't think I'm gonna be able to uh, get there. It's but, actually, yeah. it's it's pretty tough to induce failure. No, you'll, you'll, I'll stand it back, I know how, but... Um, yeah, so then you can, you can also go... Stuff, no, I don't know. Because this thing will deploy your new app and it'll switch the um, endpoint over once the app is healthy. So um, uh, yeah, it you uses won't, Eureka. You won't see failures. Yeah, but it, it uses Eureka. But what what I do when I do the uh, the demo here is I just delete the vit, the visit service and then this thing tries yeah. to. Oh, you can see there, there's a failure. Let's go through here. There's there we go. Empty status code three fifty. Investigate failures. Uh, there's a failure there. Okay, cool. We've got the count uh, undefined. Okay, so there was an undefined here. Let's see what the, it was trying to do there. Uh, and it was HTTP GET. It was uh, going to Netty. Uh, the health. Okay, yeah, because I haven't implemented yeah, the health. On health. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why. So then you get the failure there. And th this is really nifty because now I can actually just screenshot this and send it through. You can copy the link, send it through the dev team or okay. the if operations you, if team. You, if you screenshot it instead of copy the the call stack, then you're fired from my team. So um, I'm sorry. I I... Better. So what you can do here <laughs> in on application log here uh, with application map is that you can go into the live metrics uh, or the failures. You can go straight into the failures. You can say, here's yeah. the failures. Here's all the failures that you've got. Uh, and you don't even have to do that. So you can go back in there. So there's so many ways to get into the same uh, view that you see there. And this, yeah. this is really telemetry on a, a massive scale. And it's, it's enabled, mm -hmm. as you send the Spring Boot uh, application there, it just enables it. Uh, and it's really Kubernetes. What we took is Azure Kubernetes, all of the telemetry there, because uh, enabled there with .NET. <laughs> this is telemetry written mm -hmm. in .NET. And we took that .NET telemetry and we just added it to Azure Spring Cloud running on Kubernetes. So this is .NET. So people who are listening, if you are building an application as multiple microservices, which you should consider first if whether uh, you want to break stuff up, because the moment you do, um, you need very good observability to try and figure out what's happening. Um, I mean, I think this is a, uh, let's call it, it's a um, manufactured example to, yes, yes. Um, to, to, to illustrate. But in reality, um, stuff this small, I never break apart things um, that small because it's, it's, it's literally just deciding that my function calls are now uh, taking milliseconds instead of um, nanoseconds. And um, um, it's an unnecessary overhead. Uh, the only time when you when you start taking stuff apart is um, if it if it if 
on the one hand, uh, it's a, it puts a strain on the team. In other words, you find that two parts of your team are hardly like talking to each other, but they're fighting with different pieces of code. Well, then it's two microservices. Um, but, um, and the other part is if you've got one aspect of your application that needs to scale massively, whereas the rest of it doesn't, and um, uh, you don't want to scale a big thing um, to many instances, if there's only this one small part that you need to scale. If you look at, uh, for example, Netflix is an example um, of that. Um, the workload for them to serve the content is enormous, but uh, the, the, um, the component that does that um, is one component that they scale massively. But the component that does the core customer management and sign up and stuff is actually still a single instance that runs somewhere on a single database that is replicated because that one instance uh, that scaled vertically in that case can do the job and it keeps the complexity down because so, the moment you have uh, something that does complex transactions and you scale that multiple times, then um, uh, you've got some challenges. So you always have to try and scale in the right direction before you take things apart. And only when you've got two elements that want to scale in different directions, that's when you, um, when, when you uh, move them apart. And you'll typically see that they, um, uh, they might interact in this. If you look at the Netflix example, the thing that serves the content is a read only um, a, a, a consumer of the customer data and um, it will then decide uh, if you're allowed to see something and, um, and serve the content. And um, if you've used Netflix, you'll know that it actually takes them a little while before they once, if, if there was something that happened to a payment, it'll take them a while before they stop serving yeah, the content. Yeah, because it caches it. Yes, because they decided that um, the cost of keeping that interaction um, uh, um, small in, in terms of time um, actually cost them more than the little bit of money they lose on the people who stop paying and... Um, my watch an extra episode of something uh, for free and um, it's always trade-offs so um, uh, keep that in mind and um, uh, retain your sanity by, by um, uh, keeping the code together until you really need to take it apart and then you carefully decide uh, what goes where because people jump in and they start designing microservices and um, uh, uh, the chance of the, you actually needing multiple microservices are um, much smaller than you think. Um, but and all of this said, technology is is incredible in allowing you to understand what's going on and to to so uh, scale. I like what you said uh, with the one service, but it just scales out. And then it just uses Eureka to kind of uh, do the, the load balancing. So if you look at the screen that I've got there, you mm. can take the customer service there and you can do exactly that. So you can go up mm -hmm. to 500 instances. Those are big instances. You can go up to mm -hmm. 500 instances. Now, the, the novelty is that that Kubernetes cluster there with 500 uh, 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 worker nodes there, kubelets, that you're going to just pop the customer service on there and then you're just going to scale it just and this is this is all in the same instance the same billing so you get 500 mm. instances uh, per service uh, for multiple services though and you build uh, for that amount also though so you don't build extra for those services well that fit better be very busy with the animals because that pet clinic is <laughs> Yeah, that's 500 <laughs> customers. Eh? The customer <laughs> services there. So yeah, it's it's. I don't know if you know uh, uh, Kroger, one of the largest supermarket chains in mm -hmm. in America. They run this and they mm -hmm. scale out uh, on multiple instances though, um, and it just it just scales. And oh, I mean, the moment you're 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 of that size, then obviously you have to scale. But the the reality is that most people work for a company that. Uh, that yeah, yeah. So then, that scale. in in that case, you you then you just go into 
if you remember what I showed you there, you just use yeah. the app service there and you can yeah. go into the free tier. You can go, and I'm not recommending the free tier because I like mm -hmm. power and you, you, Java developers like memory. So then you can go into the free tier. What I didn't show you is I've got a whole- oh, That's Terraform unfortunate thing. with uh, with Java is that it is memory hungry. Yeah, no, don't don't use free tiers on clouds uh, in, in with Java though. N none of them are really are going to meet your expectations. Mm -hmm. But this over here, you can you can see uh, what it runs here. So and let me just see what I've got uh, this running here. So if I go open a portal, uh, and that's the instance that ran the H two database, uh, and then you you can go in there. Now I, I think I've got this on a P one V two, which is uh, it's about uh, forty dollars a month. And that's a big mm. instance. It's like mm. uh, a, a four gigs of RAM, a couple of CPUs. But you can downscale that all the way to burst, uh, burst instances. Now, burst instances, they take all of your monthly kind of accumulated uh, CPUs and they let you use it when you want to um, instead of uh, using, uh, you know, a, a, a single layer though. So let's go here. Uh, let's go scale. Uh, yeah, scale no, why would people complain about that price? You say no. Five years ago, you paid two hundred dollars a month for a smaller VM. So, um, just put that in perspective because that's six dollars a month. Yeah, look at that. Six dollars so, a month, um, and then you get uh, one point five gigs of memory, and you get uh, like burst there. So, and then you can you can go all the way down, and the, the free one here, you know, it's it's great, but it's I, I find no, that's for it's 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 it's. it's it's for a little demo or for, um, hey, yeah, I want to yeah. just host a web app that can um, uh, um, accept a, a contact form and do something fancy with it. Or and if you really want power, like the S3 there, seven gigs memory, uh, you know, you get, it's, it's $100 a month, but this thing, mm. it comes with your own SSL. You can always go up to 10 instances, staging slots, so production, staging, dev, daily backups. Uh, you know, it's, it's just power. Oh, I, I usually go, yeah. yeah, I usually go with, uh, with that uh, in demos though. Um, you know, there's so many different freaking options. I, I can't keep tapping. This one got 32 gigs of uh, memory. I mean, like it's a laptop. Um, yeah, and then you can go also isolated, uh, you know, VNet here uh, that, that, well, I don't have access to that. But that's the one thing. Then, then you can go, containers and there's so many different options that you can actually do cloud though but my, my the whole thing i wanted to show you today is that you know the development process around it it just got click click done 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 i know my, it looked a little bit easy when i did it though um but it's it's it really that's that's simple and they mm -hmm. they do that and they they have telemetry over who uses it and how they use it and then they they feed back the hypothesis to the project team and i sit with the uh, the project team and go that's a good feature. That's not a good feature. Uh, the, the hypothesis proves it. Get rid of that or improve that. And that's what they do the whole day. And they make sure that that's exactly that's, what the customers are using. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's, the, I mean, that's the thing that we never had. Uh, the development experience life cycle used to be incredibly long um, and spotty. Um, because you just got the guys who were the loudest who got the feedback to the... Um, to the customer and um, but now you've got an organization with enormous resources that are actively looking at how people are using the tools Held accountable. And, Held and, 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 and improving it and um, uh, that's awesome it's 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 going to make other people bleed uh, pretty soon because the reality is that the experience most expensive thing in software is sitting in the chair. Um, it's not, um, it, 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 I mean, uh, the, the cost of your uh, uh, cloud environment is negligible, negligible compared to that. And the only time when it, it, it really uh, becomes an issue is if you, if you start moving into a massive scale. And even there, um, as you can see, if you if you, if you if you make good choices, um, uh, uh, you can keep it um, um, affordable. And um, but that's that's when you start looking at um, at making the best sizing choices for your containers um, in terms of how many you want to run versus how big they are, and um, how dynamically you want to scale up and down and um, you've got all the tools to monitor that and that way you can then 
Um, but I mean, when you get there to the point that um, your scaling so your, your your scaling needs are such, um, you are already making a lot of money because um, unless you're just trying to sell ads, but <laughs> most people want to sell something more meaningful or provide a meaningful service. And if you then have a scaling problem, um, then it means you're doing business, and um, and then you just need the tools to help you make good decisions and get the feedback. And that's why observability is a big deal. That's why everything you showed us is a big deal. And um, frankly, from what I've seen in um, um, the other players, uh, um, they're not investing in, in, in the same space. And um, uh, they're not uh, concerned with the developer experience to the same extent. So um, uh, this, the, 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 the balance is shifting. Yeah, it's, it's, not your, it's not your grandfather's uh, Microsoft, that's for sure. No. Okay, um, so that's everything I wanted to show you. Um, and uh, thanks, you can reach me on Twitter. Uh, if you want uh, Twitter, there's my Twitter handle. That's a, a laptop running Windows, running PowerPoint, solely for the purpose of you uh, accessing at Rory Pretty yeah, on my Twitter. <laughs> sure. My Mac does my, my, my day job and that's my, my mistress that does my, my PowerPoint. <laughs>